Okay, so I welcome everybody to this afternoon's session of the special occasion to the graduation ceremony, at the graduation ceremony of the, this year's onwards and doctors, students at IG Delft. And we have always, as usual, a small symposium at the very beginning this year, two talks, and the first one is by Arnold Obrecht from Hydrologic, which is also in Dutch company, yes, the German sure. company, as far as I understood, and we have been long time affiliated to this institution, to the IAG Delft, and I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Let me first try to switch lights to the lighter. Well, welcome everybody. So I'm Mike John. Who are the graduating students today? Yeah. How many are you? 24. 24. So not everybody is here yet. Yes. Hope the rest will arrive uh, soon. Um, well, very welcome. I, I tend to say welcome, even though I'm not a staff member here anymore. But I've been a staff member for so long a time here that I tend to say welcome to everybody. So uh, to the students, of course, to uh, family online, maybe, and uh, former colleagues, professors. Um, it's an honor to be here and to talk to you about hydroinformatics uh, uh, today. Um, I will give you a brief overview of what we have done in our company, but let me first start by introducing myself. Um, I'm actually a civil engineer from TU Delft uh, here. Um, I graduated in 86, so that's 33 years ago. Um, then I started working with the HP Consult, which is called Royal Hospital in the UK. Um, during that period, I started my PhD research here at TU. Uh, in uh, control of water systems and right after I got my PhD diploma I started uh, also at IG here in part time so I've worked here for 15 years uh, in this institute in the year 2000 um, I established this uh, uh, company called Hydrologic which I will tell you a lot more uh, soon uh, we are basically um, very active in the field of water management and we do so by modeling, hydrodynamic modeling, hydrological modeling and also ICT solutions. So this is what my talk is going to be about, the ICT solutions. And then 10 years later I started uh, a company uh, which is actually the research branch of hydrologic together with a former colleague of uh, IC, Stavros Lyskov. And um, that company is here actually at the rest fest as well, so it's close by. Um, and then we do the research activities at the company. And then four years later I started yet another company, that was the last one I promised to myself, uh, which is focusing much more on weather and climate. And that uh, company I established together with a good friend of mine, Ted Lindstein, who is also the National Weather Manager now. Um, I'll focus on hydrology, but by the end I will show you some uh, achievements of weather impact uh, as well. This is our office in Amersfoort. We are there with uh, around 40 people uh, from hydrologic and eight from weather impact. This is the office here in, uh, in Delft. It's right opposite uh, the railway station. Um, and these are uh, people from the Amersfoort uh, office. To give you an idea of what kind of clients we are working for, I made this, uh, this overview. There are many more, but these are just representing uh, uh, the client groups. We work a lot for water authorities, 60% of our work, municipalities, uh, and all the other uh, clients which you see here. In the Netherlands, we work for almost all water boards and 100 uh, municipalities. Um, I found this beautiful uh, picture of this tube by the wheel. Uh, this is uh, in the River Rhine, actually. And I show this because this is one of the regulating structures which we have in the River Rhine. Major uh, rivers uh, in the Netherlands, next to the news. Um, and why I show this is because we help our client like rival staff in managing the water amounts which come through this uh, uh, weir and 
is uh, to distribute it over a country. But especially you can hardly imagine about who have drought problems in this country. And uh, especially in, in summer period, it is essential that we divert the water correctly over the country to ensure that all water users get enough water. So this is uh, representing that. This is uh, the Haarlem Fleet Sluice. Anyone who has ever heard of the Haarlem Fleet Sluices? No? This is the, uh, this is the <laughs> very mouth of the uh, river, right? And the interesting thing is that this is a sweet estuarium. It's closed off from the sea and only at, when there is excess water, it's flowing to the sea. Um, and now the uh, government has uh, uh, taken the decision to open these sluices also when you have high tides to allow inflow of saline water into the estuary, which is sweet right now. And the idea is to allow um, uh, salmon and trout to pass this, uh, this, this sluice and to swim upstream. And the challenge, of course, is to ensure that the salt water is not entering our irrigation system, which we have in the country, of course, and also the, the water intake for drinking water. So we have to, by, by, by regulating this, this structure, and do a lot of research in that uh, respect. I think, the, uh, I think it's the box. I think it's the box where it is. The one that's connected to the microphone. It's here. This one? Oh, this, this one seems to work. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so we help them in controlling, in finding control rules for for us uh, schools. This is maybe I have to go to walk. The reception is right on that side. The reception is where? Where you Close to here. Ah. Oh, sure. Right there here? Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is another uh, picture of the Netherlands. This is in the 1995 the situation where we had a flood in uh, the Netherlands. And the water levels in the river Waal were so high that there was a risk of these embankments overtopping by, uh, by the water. And this led to the evacuation of 250,000 people from that particular area. And unfortunately, uh, dikes didn't break, so after two weeks, everybody could return safely home. Um, but this type of events were a trigger, actually, for many water boards in the Netherlands to start uh, investigate how to deal with such events and how to to well, ensure that people are out of that area in time and how to manage the water as far as it is possible. So we help them a lot in this type of work. This is the uh, last year, very dry year. Uh, shipping was hardly possible uh, uh, in our rivers. And this was an extreme situation. We never faced that uh, so much before. And this is two years in a row, it looks like now. Um, and uh, this causes uh, uh, lots of uh, losses uh, in the shipping industry because uh, cargo shipping was hardly possible during those days. This is dike burst, and the dike burst, uh, which happened after a dry period, this was 2003, and um, this is peat dike. We have uh, 4,500 kilometers of uh, peat dikes in the Netherlands. And probably they will all be very sensitive to this type of drying which is happening here and through which this dike broke actually. So we had flooding in a dry period. Um, so this is also new. And it led to a new movement in the Netherlands to do more frequent dike inspections. So what we do as Hardologic, we advise our clients through our tools where and when to do these inspections. On the basis of satellite images, we determine how dry the dike is. So they can well, do their work in a more optimal way. This is typically uh, typical uh, uh, rain gauge, of which we use lots of uh, lots of data. There are a few more. This is a radar with which we measure rainfall uh, in the Netherlands. This is from KNY. Built groundwater sensoring we use a lot, and of course satellite images to determine soil moisture. Um, this is what we call the control room. This is the hardware of the control room, but behind that is the software which we deliver. And actually, this waterboard, waterboard Riviereland, was the first one to take a subscription to our services, which we call Hydronet, the Hydronet services. And uh, they use our, our software to get an overview of the water management in the system, the ongoing uh, process of water management. And, um, so they have a digital uh, information uh, uh, here, which they can have in any location, basically. They don't have to do it here in this control. 
But this is a nice example of also a physical control. This is in uh, 2013. You can see the happy man there on the right. That's me. I was so happy because we won a prize, ICT uh, Innovation Award in 2013. This is a national uh, prize for uh, best product of the year. Um, but was also with Hydrant. And this, uh, I'm even more proud about, this 2017, two years ago, we won the Partners for Water Award. And this was for a sustainable uh, project which we performed with partners in South Africa, of which I'm going to show you more shortly. Well, let's uh, have a look at, uh, at the Hydrant services which we, uh, which we developed for uh, water professionals. And this is basically all what I'm going to show you is typically Hydrant commands. Um, but let's start with this film first to give you an introduction. Uh, water managers have huge dams of people that come and come. So have to make very good for the system because they have to deal with floods, they have to deal with drought. And the first step to make the right decisions is access to data. Because if you know what the water is like expected, you can already identify suitable measures to reduce the impact. And before a hydro map, the water manager really has to search for data. Uh, look at one website, look at another, you can tell databases. But HydroMap does all that work for you. So they just open the dashboard in the field or wherever there's an internet connection and they only see the information they need. So they don't need to search for data anymore. In the case of uh, government to government uh, program, we will work together with the South African Catchment Management Agency for a long time already. We have presence in South Africa, therefore, um, like the South African Weather Institute. They have a lot of valuable uh, weather information that they didn't believe the water manager. So the Partners for Water program made it possible to implement uh, the hydrant for every demonstration project in one of the CMAs. And now it's going to be available as a whole this year. South Africa suffers from water stress. There isn't enough good quality water coming in. And climate events such as El Nino worsen the situation. Because of the growing economy and population, by 2030, the total demand will be way above the water availability. The only solution is to manage and utilize this precious resource much more efficiently. To make reliable water management decisions, access to historic, current, and forecasted weather information is of key importance. Therefore, the consortium worked together with the South African Weather Service. We have a lot of weather information, but we did not have the operational tools to be able to enhance and share it. With the cooperation of the Dutch Lake Service, ONI, and Hydrolive, we have been able to improve our data policy as well as our data system. And now, we make all our data available to Hydrolite. With the relationship that we have with our commercial companies, we are able to really understand their requirements and provide the right information for them to make good decisions. The first South African Catchment Monitoring Authority to cooperate in the HydroMet Control Group has been implemented this year. Now our data challenge is to ensure that uh, all the people, our users, have got good quality of water and they have adequate access. Of main catchment area, it has boundary catchment. That means that we need to ensure that as per the international obligations, our neighbors and neighbors are good with all the volume of water that they are supposed to get as per the contract. Hydromet helps us to get a snapshot of the water availability. So we're able to look at the rainfall and precipitation to be able to tell how much quantity of water we will have. And the resources, uh, the pots that are there also in Hydromet are able to help us to predict based on the forecast what kind of volumes are going to happen. Those are the data that make management decisions regarding how each and every one of our users can access them. Well, Hydromet is a very open and stable ICT solution and it's also a very open partner model. So in this project, we really were able to benefit from the expertise from all the partners. And it's very easy to add new data, to add new tools, to add new models, and become part of our consortium. So, um, because of the scalability, uh, Hydrogen not only in South Africa, but also already in 10 other countries, uh, uh, more than 2,300 users at the moment, and we are very proud of that. Uh, it's fantastic to see that thanks to our cooperation with South African Weather Service, of 
only the living market do this type, and then also the agricultural market and the energy market. So in the meantime, we already have 25 follow-up contracts, and we expect more. So, just to summarize what this uh, shows you in the film, uh, you see here the different uh, uses of, uh, of Hibernate, what you can do with, uh, with the system. So it's built to build these digital uh, uh, water control rooms. You can have personalized dashboards, so every user can have his own dashboard. It's accessible through any uh, computer device. It's used for transboundary studies in dashboards, so they share the same dashboard. Uh, community portals to communicate with uh, the public, notifications and warnings uh, for water professionals mainly, and automatic reports. I'll show you a few, uh, few of, the, uh, of the examples. Um, now currently, uh, Ironet is being used by 4,600 users in 12 countries. And these are the countries where we are active. You see high concentration in the eastern part of uh, Africa. So these are the applications of, uh, of Hydronet uh, for water management, and I'll go through them uh, very briefly. This is what we call the RainWatch application, where you can click on a map and then get the rainfall information, which is measured by radar or rain gauges. You get the time series if you, if you like. Um, this is the dashboard, which is used by the South African Weather Service to look at their own data, basically. Um, this is a, a control room which we have developed for the Rijkswaterstaat together with the water boards, the surrounding water boards, um, with which they can work together and see some low water levels coming, like here, so a few days ahead. And they can compare also the current situation with uh, the uh, historic situation um, to probability analysis. Um, so this is used very intensively by large uh, groups of, uh, of professionals. This is what we call traffic light uh, approach, in which you use these different colors to show whether the situation is as wanted or not. So all the green dots are okay. And we use that also uh, a lot to get a very fast overview of what's happening in what system. This similar approach, but now for groundwater, and here we compare again with uh, long year averages. Um, this is also used to, um, to determine when uh, agriculture cannot use any irrigation water anymore, so it cannot be subtracted anymore from groundwater. So the water boards use this a lot. And this is uh, based on satellite imagery. Uh, we determine the, let's say, the wetness of the soil, so not only the moisture, but the wetness, including walls uh, for the subsoil to determine whether there's a dry period coming or a very wet period coming. And if the soil is completely soaked and there is an extra rainfall, you get discharges much faster. So this is also used a lot to, to uh, see these changes uh, of seasons, for instance, in the Netherlands. Um, these pictures are taken uh, during a, a training, a training of operators, and uh, they use what we call the Vizier uh, uh, water control room, also in uh, waterboard uh, uh, Rivierland, um, where they have a complete overview of uh, risky areas along dikes, and also they can monitor the measures which are taken. So it's the closing of, uh, of, uh, of coupures and uh, the use of sluices and uh, all kinds of regulating uh, structures. And this type of training is done uh, uh, once a year, as you can see that even the military is, uh, is, involved, uh, is involved here. So it's very nice to be there and to see how things are happening in the practice. And uh, well, it's good to know that people are prepared for such events as in 95. Um, this is in Australia. There is a very open policy um, with respect to uh, flooding risks. So there's a flood map. It's open to the public. You can click on the map or your houses, for instance, and determine what the flood risk of your house is. There's a lot of discussion going on about this in the Netherlands where we should do, do similar things. Um, and right now we are not doing it because it also determines, uh, of course, your premium for your uh, insurance. Um, this is another uh, control room uh, recently developed for uh, uh, the Hermana project in Colombia. This is actually what quality and what the quantity uh, management in the uh, Cauca Valley. And all these things are also configurably co to be configured on your uh, mobile phone. So every user can have a mobile phone app which shows the dashboard of his own. 
So let me now show you a few of the uh, achievements which you actually have in, in, in water also for agriculture. Um, also this we can call hydroinformatics uh, applications of course. This is um, what we call water auditing. Uh, water auditing is a way for the water boards to determine how much water is used by farmers and whether they have passed the limit uh, of the contract which they have with the water boards because they well, should not be using too much water. And this is down to the field level, so 50,000 fields are monitored uh, in this way. And you can see here in the map that everything which is red is too much water use. And by using this application only for just a few years, they were able to reduce the water use by 20%. So that's quite something in a drought uh, sensitive uh, country. Um, this is a novel uh, thing which uh, there's a large program going on in the Netherlands uh, uh, about, uh, about the, the making available of all kinds of agricultural services to large groups of farmers. Um, and we are involved there uh, as well. So here's a lady with a feature phone, a traditional Nokia phone and stuff. Um, and now the question is how to get the information on how to uh, do the water management and the agriculture to this, uh, to this lake. No. This happens to all kinds of applications. This is one more advanced which runs on, uh, on, a, on a smartphone application which is available in many languages as you can see. Um, and they get very specific local advices on, for instance, when to sow, um, what the uh, grow capacity of, uh, of, the, of the vegetation uh, is. Um, when, yeah, I have all these things like this with microphones, so it's, yeah, but also when, when to harvest, so the best moment to harvest is also uh, uh, presented. Um, these are just a few, uh, few of the uses of, uh, of this phone app. These are farmers in South Africa. Uh, on the occasion of the introduction of the AgriCloud uh, app. Now, how do these people get uh, this, uh, this information? They get it through, for instance, extension workers. These have uh, smartphones. They register the farmers, so they uh, uh, register the name, the location, the kind of crop, and so on. And then uh, when these people are registered, we can send via SMS the messages to them. So they get very local information on, for instance, this type uh, of weather forecast, but also all kinds of agricultural advisories. Right, to briefly show you something of, uh, of the business models which we have uh, developed, very briefly, because as a company we have to live from this type of services. It's not only research, it's really, really practice. So I will show you very briefly how we do it. Um, basically, as Hydrologic, we can provide all the services necessary. We can deliver the data, the applications, the platform HydroNet we have. We distribute the applications to the clients, to the end users. We can all do all these things ourselves, and we actually do in the Netherlands. Um, but when you go abroad, when you go to different countries, that's much more difficult because you have no local network at all. So we found that a much better way of working, and we applied it in the Netherlands now as well, is to work in teams of different organizations where every organization does the job in which it is best. So you see here different uh, roles now, and these can all be different organizations. That's also true for what we call knowledge providers. These are usually research institutes which helps us to validate uh, uh, the data which we are delivering. Now, how does it look like for the water auditing app for South Africa, which I just showed you? Here is, well, the same uh, roles you have here, and you can see here that the end user is the Incomati, the one of the film. Uh, South African Weather Service is the local distributor, so they ensure that all the information is going to the end users. We provide a platform. We have jointly developed with a company called eLeaf, they are experts in satellite information, the applications which we serve. The data is not from us, it's from eLeaf again and South African Weather Service and the knowledge providers in this case are KNMI and some Dutch water boards. This formula works and uh, actually we as a company live from this for a large extent. 
and to show you how it looks when you go to other types of applications in different countries. Well, these are uh, other partners with whom we work, and um, uh, well, these are just a few, and it's it's, it's actually growing. Um, so uh, this is our business model, and it uh, ensures that all the different parties in this chain get a fair share of the income from uh, from this type of application. Well, with this, I would like to uh, to conclude my my keynote, and hope I have given you a view of how you can use hydroinformatics servers to assist uh, water managers and to help them to do their jobs better in creating better water quality, deal with drought situations, especially to deal with floods. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very enlightening, very interesting, very much developed already networking facility and based on very good scientific and, and also interrelated network and facilities. So that's, I think, something to look into also for the students. They will be interested also to ask questions. So this is not the time to ask questions. Maybe to give you some... They expect to be graduated this afternoon, so there are no more questions. Let's look at the incentive. This is a potential company hiring uh, people that get a graduation ceremony in the afternoon, so maybe that will encourage you even more. <laughs> if not, so we can start with Luis, Luis from this one. Yes, uh, what is uh, the of this new drone uh, information, you have a protocol to integrate your data. Sorry, I don't the understand. Drone. The drones? Yeah. Ah, yes. Well, I didn't show it. Well, the, we we are working with drone uh, drone analysis. It's, it's not a commercial product yet, but we are researching how we can use drones to uh, make inventories, for instance, of drought uh, and cracks in dikes. This is one. But also, we have recently finished a study to, uh, to research whether we can identify people in flooded areas to know where to send, uh, send help. Um, so in this way, we are well, entering that area. But for us as a company, it's very important that we go into areas where others don't go. So we look at the white spots, so to call. Additional questions? Okay, there are many, so we start with the students. Yes. 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 Very good question, because especially in those situations where you have limited resources, how to divert the water? So the platform doesn't say the water manager what to do, but it shows the different options. So you have all kinds of scenario analysis, but also along the, the, the information on how the current state in the water system is, is already quite a step forward for many water uh, uh, controlling agencies. So. Um, we don't do automatic control. We don't do the automatic optimization of uh, diversion of water over different users, but we advise the clients. So additional questions? Okay. So we just go ahead. Okay. Um, so the question is like uh, with the data distribution system, does Hydrologic also take care of that, or do you at least either into that that portion of it, like? Was the data has been processed and has been distributed to the farmers when you said. So there is like smallholder and commercial different kinds of farms in South Africa. So do we also look into that, like how much is the success rate of that or the end result of it? Yeah, yeah. Well, we did so in Ethiopia actually, uh, one of the countries where we are active. Uh, so these extension workers went out to determine uh, 
what what farmers think of the quality of, of better forecasts which we provide them. And they were very, very enthusiastic. And I think 95% was, uh, was very positive about uh, the weather forecast. And then we asked additional questions because we couldn't believe that our forecasts are so good. And then it appeared that they have no source of information at all at the moment. So whatever, even when it is uncertain, uh, information you give them, which is of course more or less close to the truth, uh, it helps them already a lot. So we get this feedback. And we expect actually more feedback because we want to use these, these smartphone apps to create actually a link with the end users and to get their feedback continuously about the quality of our forecasts so that we can um, uh, uh, make our forecast more specific to those locations. Okay. So, there's one final question I have to say for this time is running. So Maybe hand over to Graham to ask another question. So how do the southern partners benefit from this government change? Yeah. More than just um, in terms of information, but financial. Good question. So we, as a, uh, taking the, we have taken the initiative to work in this way. So we have developed business models in which we ensure that the different parties involved in providing one application, for instance, to end users, that every uh, organization involved get a fair share. So what we usually do when we enter a new market, no one can earn anything. So when the first clients come, then we start to distribute the income over the different parts. Also, balancing how much they have invested in the, 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 the apps. Um, but the, these apps can, can uh, distribute very rapidly. We have 450,000 end users for the uh, your apps. So we don't have their income yet because smallholder farmers are very difficult to do. But for other apps, the, uh, the actually the water boards and the municipalities. And uh, often, even when they distribute these apps to uh, uh, citizens, then they are still the ones who are applying to the income which we can So it's, it's, it's actually a fair share to, to give you an example. Or I ask them if they developed an app, which is a uh, um, providing information on the plot so you can go to the fields, make pictures, and they connect it to the IMF platform. The income comes, we distribute it over the different parties which are uh, equal. And the same is, for instance, for Esri. Esri is also a platform provider like we, uh, like we are. So if a client has already an Esri subscription, they can use this, this type of uh, uh, service. So there's always an earning model for the different parties involved. But how it is composed also depends on their roles and the investments which you have to do to make the application work. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, we can discuss that later. I think that's also a very important aspect of doing research, doing a company. There needs to be some basis for that, so it's, I think it's understandable. I think we have also to clap again our hands to thank you for your <laughs> contribution. <laughs> Second speaker of this small symposium, which is Matan's daughter from a company that's maybe even more well known than Hydro um, Logic, which is Shell, a company that has always been very much interested in water, maybe as a byproduct they need for exploiting, exploiting for example, um, oil. Um, yes, yeah. so it gives me some chance to bridge yeah. Yeah. until everything is connected again and we will listen to a very interesting talk on prospects and challenges for future hydrogeologists in groundwater and energy. Um, yeah, so congratulations first of all to all of you, the students in particular and also the teachers who managed to uh, bring these students up to this level. 
Um, yeah, my name is Matthijs Bonte. I work with Shell Global Solutions. Uh, the talk I'll be giving today is sort of more general on groundwater uh, challenges in, the, uh, in different kinds of energy. Uh, so I'm not here officially representing Shell or anything. I'm taking examples and trying to show you of different things I did throughout my career as a hydrogeologist that I thought are uh, really illustrative of um, yeah, the challenges that you find in the energy uh, sector. Okay. You guys. Oh. Okay, is it working yeah. now? Yes, yeah, okay. okay. And that one? Now this one? Um. Van die, maar daar heb ik het dingetje van gehad. Ik dacht misschien dat het dan wel Oké. Nee, anders moet je gaan. Gewoon zo? Ja. Oké. Oké, so uh, first a little introduction about myself. Then uh, have a little look at uh, how the, the world will change in terms of energy. Uh, I think that's an important context setter. Uh, and then uh, I'll be talking about the links and how, as a hydrogeologist, uh, you can work on different projects. So I'm going to be both looking at uh, the fossil energies, working now for Shell, so that's most of my work now. And also some of the new uh, energy forms, some of the new uh, uh, renewable energies that I've been working on well, still at currently and also in my previous uh, jobs. Um, so what I intended to do was mainly to make you enthusiastic, as, uh, especially the part from the Groundwater Watch uh, uh, program, to make you enthusiastic of all the new opportunities that uh, this transition in the energy world will bring also for hydrogeologists. Uh, working myself at Shell, often people are surprised that they say, why does Shell own or uh, employ hydrogeologists? Well, there are in a big company working in a big energy field, a lot of areas where uh, groundwater knowledge is uh, necessary. So first a little bit about myself. Uh, I graduated in 2000 at uh, the VU University of Wageningen in, uh, in hydrogeology. My uh, final project was with uh, uh, Mr. Stichter in uh, Portugal, looking at uh, salinization in, uh, in the Algarve, which was uh, a good start of my career. Uh, then I worked uh, for a number of years, first in Australia and uh, also in Yemen. Uh, Indonesia and especially uh, water supply projects for different sectors, uh, also mining in Australia. Uh, so quite a variety of different, uh, of different things. Uh, 2008, I went to uh, KWR, which is a, a company uh, owned by all the water utilities in the Netherlands, a research organization. And I started looking at uh, uh, predominantly uh, shallow geothermal energy or geothermal energy and how it impacts on uh, groundwater quality. And then about six years ago, I went to Shell, um, the oil and gas sector, and looking mainly at uh, water sourcing for projects and contaminated land management. And below are some nice uh, holiday pictures that I took, took while working. Okay, so a bit of a primer. What will the uh, tomorrow's energy supply look like for us? Well, we basically don't really know for certain. That's, I guess, the, the real truth. We can uh, speculate about it, and that's what different organizations in the world do. So, yeah, for example, the, the, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, you have uh, NGOs like Greenpeace, and you also have Shell that has a scenarios department that uh, put in the world different scenarios of where the world could be heading, depending on technology development, on policy developments, and then they sort of speculate how the energy distribution could look like. So uh, there are different scenarios here that depend on how much uh, aggressive policy change will be. And the latest uh, Shell scenario um, took into consideration the Paris Agreement uh, and the ambitions that are formulated there and uh, developed the sky scenario, which shows that basically uh, uh, oil uh, will uh, well, quite drastically be phased out. It still be needed uh, in 2100. Gas will also be uh, 
phased out quite a lot, and uh, especially solar, and uh, to a lesser extent, um, uh, wind will really take over. And also geothermal will be a uh, quite a uh, important uh, supplier of uh, renewable energy. So the obvious question for this group of people is obviously, what does that mean for for hydrogeologists who are starting their career now, and who are probably going to be working until uh, well, maybe not 2100, but at least to 2050 or 2070, <laughs> I imagine. Overall, the picture is more and cleaner energy. So big picture, the challenge, uh, if you look at the population growth also, there's going to be more people, uh, more prosperity, the, the rise of uh, level of, uh, of wealth in especially the developing countries will increase a lot, uh, like you see in China, for example, uh, putting a huge burden on, uh, on energy demands and also on water, and they are all related. So uh, let me start off with the, the sort of fossil uh, fuel sector where I'm working now. Uh, how, how does um, yeah, hydrogeologists work in that sector? And what kind of challenges do you encounter in that sector? And what does it mean with the transition that we are facing now? So two photos here, one from Nigeria, uh, completely different setting than uh, Assen. I think the, the right hand photo is where you have the Jaaknikkers, famous for the Dutch people. If you look at sort of the big picture, the, the kind of topics that I work on are, uh, can be divided in two groups. Um, it's basically contaminated land management. So if you have an accidental release of hydrocarbons, uh, you need to manage that, you need to clean it up, you need to assess the risks. Uh, it can be both on uh, small retail sites, uh, increasing to uh, depots uh, and refineries and pipelines. And on the right hand side, you have more the water sourcing aspect. So uh, in all uh, parts of the, the, the sort of value chain of uh, oil and gas, you have uh, uh, you re require water, so you often require it to extract oil, to wash it at upstream facilities. In gas uh, development, uh, refineries have a huge water demand, so that is, that's a critical part of that work, especially for new projects, but also for existing facilities which can be located in areas which, uh, um, yeah, where water resources are stressed uh, because of climate change or because of increasing population. So to put it in words, what, what are these kind of issues? Uh, last couple of years, it's been mostly on contaminated land. So you have legacy contamination issues. So legacy means it could be there for a while and you start to redevelop an area and then you need to deal with those, those issues. Uh, that's an area that um, I'm expecting to increase quite a bit as the, the, the portfolio of companies like Shell or other oil companies will shift uh, towards uh, away from oil and gas then a lot of these facilities will need to be cleaned up. And if they are, uh, for example, close to uh, urban areas, they, they represent quite uh, some value in, for the ground. So uh, they need to be redeveloped and uh, remediated. So the water use, I mentioned that already. Uh, the fracking is a lot in the news, but also with uh, conventional oil, there's a huge water demand. Uh, leaking wells, or alleged leaking wells, that's uh, even a topic I put in there. It was last week on the news in the Netherlands where uh, this issue was brought up, and fracking. That's uh, probably the topic that I can uh, defend myself mostly against at uh, family dinners, that I have to uh, <laughs> defend Shell from all the, the things that are done there. So I think that's also the last sentence there. It's often controversial, the projects, uh, but interesting work for hydrogeologists. You, you do often find yourself defending because you work in a sort of environmental department of big oil, but uh, they do represent interesting projects. I think, yeah, for me, myself, it's always like, it, it is there, it has brought a lot of prosperity over the uh, last hundred years, and you do need to yeah, also responsibly uh, deal with the environmental impacts. So in that sense, it's, it's quite valuable to work as a hydrogeologist in a company like that. That's sort of the, 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 the bigger picture. Uh, interesting project examples, I'll give a few of uh, work I did the last couple of years. Uh, this first example is, um, I think, really the opposite end of what was just presented on the high tech. This is really low tech. This is uh, in, uh, in Nigeria, where uh, well, everybody knows that there's a lot of uh, issues with spills over there. Uh, they can be operational, from leaky pipelines. They are often by, uh, by sabotage because uh, pipelines run through areas where people don't have access to energy. So there's just a lot of issues with uh, uh, theft of crude oil. But Regardless of the cost, they are cleaned up. And um, 
typical issue with working in those sort of environments is that it's really hard to get good, reliable uh, uh, analytical data. So you ideally, if you work in Holland, you would want to, before you remediate an area and after you need to collect soil samples, you analyze them in a lab and you look at whether the, the practice was uh, sufficient or not. In Nigeria, there aren't any reliable labs, basically. There are labs, but they just keep on failing the QA, QC tests. But, so if we want to collect samples, we send them off to the UK or to the Netherlands. So in a sort of different uh, expertise in uh, oil spill response, especially coastal areas, they use uh, a process called the SCAT process, uh, which was developed by the US um, Oceanographic uh, Department, the government where they base it solely on uh, visual observations, uh, which is quite useful for oil because it's, it's so uh, clearly visible in, uh, in sediments because it has a sheen, you see the droplets. So uh, you can get a lot of information just by looking at it uh, rather than analyzing it. But this was sort of a, a, a concept that if you're more in terrestrial environments where different legislations apply, uh, the regulator needed to be uh, taken on board with that. Uh, so we did a comparison where we uh, compared this sort of SCAT approach with uh, the traditional uh, laboratory analysis to see what the, the accuracy of it is. And basically you find that it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's less accurate than the lab analysis, but also if you look at the, the variability between grabbing a sample here and grabbing it five meters away, you also have an enormous variability. And if you look at the actual objective of what you want to achieve, for example, less than uh, a certain threshold, you can quite well use it. And the big advantage of it is that you can uh, go out into the field uh, with the stakeholders, so with the people from the community, with the regulators, and you can do the assessment basically there and then and decide on how you want to clean it up and when it is enough. So basically this was a calibration approach, absolutely low tech, but really valuable in, uh, in doing that work together with uh, stakeholders. So completely on the other end of the spectrum is uh, dealing with the contaminated sites in uh, in the Netherlands, where you have a benzene plume which leaked down 30 meters and you need to assess where the biodegradation is, uh, is occurring or you need to assess where the drinking water supplies are impacted or not. So obviously you cannot uh, see it with your bare uh, eyes. Uh, what we did there together with uh, our consultants is looked at the, uh, the isotopes of uh, benzene. So basically what you can do is uh, look at the the, the C12 and C13, so there are different isotopes within the benzene molecule. And what's really interesting is that the, the microbes, the bugs that eat the benzene, potentially, they can see that difference and they prefer to eat the lighter, lighter isotopic uh, benzene. So basically what you can do is you can look at the isotopic uh, distribution within the benzene to see whether it's degrading or not. And that's shown here where you see uh, basically a measure of the, the isotopic uh, uh, concentrations in deuterium and uh, C13. And on the, the lower end you see uh, the source zone, so where the contamination is leaked. And going further into the plume you see uh, the lower decreasing concentrations, but you see increasing weight of that isotope. And basically you can use that increase in weight to quantify how much biodegradation has occurred. So for more complex site, you use more complex tools, but for a simple uh, oil spill, you can also use the bare eyes combined with analytical uh, tools. Uh, another interesting example of a study we did uh, about three years ago, uh, again in Africa, is um, looking at remediation or improving of remediation technologies. If we uh, need to clean up a spill site, uh, the, way, the common way to do that in Africa, especially if it's uh, still on the ground surface, is uh, by land farming. And this is basically a technology where you uh, collect the impacted soil, you uh, aerate it sufficiently by breaking it up, and by adding uh, fertilizer, which provides nutrients to the, the bacteria, and you basically let it sit. And then after a month you may break it up again to allow new entry of air into that soil. And that's extremely effective. Um, but it was also uh, sometimes challenged by, uh, by parties involved that there should be other methods that are more effective. For example, by adding uh, bugs deliberately, so bug bacteria that can eat it up, adding surfactants or adding all sorts of things, which, um, well, from a commercial perspective, it obviously adds the price or it increases the price. 
and there was also some real doubts in whether it would really be um, yeah, speeding up things uh, at those sites. So we, we did a, um, what's called a mesocosm study. The mesocosms are basically these plastic containers, so microcosms you do in a lab with very small uh, bottles. And mesocosm is a bit small or bigger, that's sort of like a cubic meter scale. Next phase is uh, sort of a uh, real field scale, where we uh, had about 30 of these containers, filled them up with soil, uh, spiked it with uh, oil, and then tried different seven different amendments, all in triplicate and some controls, and let's see what works best. And uh, we found that a lot of these uh, products, you know, they have fancy names like Oil Eater 2000 or uh, Magic Oil Buster Booster. Uh, yeah, it didn't really work. And some of them even worked a lot less. Hmm? It really boosts the oil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it kept the oil in there actually. Uh, what kept, what did work was biochar, which is sort of a, uh, a organic product. Uh, it's developed by uh, several companies, one of them in the UK, that did seem to speed it up. But the problem with that was that if you have a char, it can also sorb uh, oil to it. So it was sometimes a bit hard. Uh, or at least that was my challenge. Are we really seeing biodegradation or are we seeing less availability of crude oil and that you may also not pick it up in the extraction in the lab anymore? But fertilizer was um, yeah, a very good second. And if you sort of combine the prices that you see that uh, biochar would uh, increase the, uh, the cost of remediation by a factor 10, whereas fertilizer is much simpler and you may need a month more if you have the space, then it's an obvious, uh, an obvious choice. And this type of work we, uh, we did actually with the IUCN, which is an NGO, together with their input, and it was also published uh, in, uh, in literature. So this type of work we do try to yeah, make as uh, publicly available as possible. Uh, so a fourth example of a project that is uh, ongoing now, uh, ecological restoration and phytoremediation. It's a claim that's uh, often made in literature that if you can take plants, they can grow on uh, impacted soil, they can actually speed up remediation by their roots and by the, the, the way they interact with soil. So we are piloting that now. Actually, the first question at that site is, can we even replant the area? And at what levels do we need to decrease the, the oil to be able to replant, in this case, mangroves, uh, before they can uh, start growing again? And it's really surprising that in these areas, um, yeah, how tolerant these mangroves are. They can tolerate up to 3 to 4% uh, oil in the sediment. We have different degrees of, uh, of oiling in, uh, in test plots and now we are seeing whether they are actually uh, yeah, uh, actively decreasing uh, the oil uh, content in those test plots. Okay, then uh, different sector, uh, renewables, uh, obviously uh, the future more or less, uh, geothermal, ground source heating, biofuel, solar, uh, they all have a link with groundwater. With wind energy, I haven't really seen it, but with these type of technologies, I've always seen a link with groundwater. Biofuels and solar, I won't really go into that, but that's obviously the water demand. Even for solar, I've seen projects, uh, for example, in Pakistan or India, where water demand for washing of solar panels can be a real issue to see where you need to get that from. Uh, and biofuels, uh, yeah, it's much more clear. It's like an agricultural crop, so you need good water management to, uh, to get high yields. Now I'll go into geothermal and especially uh, ground source heating because I've done a lot of work in, um, in that area. So geothermal, that's uh, in the last five years really boomed in the Netherlands. So geothermal is really the deep uh, type of uh, drilling where you drill up to two, three kilometers, you extract uh, water that is 70 to 100 degrees and you use it for, uh, for warming. In the Netherlands, it's especially used by, uh, by horticulture, so uh, greenhouses. Um, there's increasing uh, scrutiny by the regulator on that topic. And often the questions are all related to impacts to, to water, or a lot, I should say. There's also some related to, uh, to tremors, for example. But uh, it's basically the same questions as you see with oil and gas. So leaky wells, uh, spills of uh, fluids at the ground surface. Uh, interestingly, uh, often they, they, they target geothermal formations, which are in other areas in the Netherlands, oil and gas formations. So they produce, they co-produce a lot of oil and gas, which then needs to be treated. 
And it's interesting because it's really a, a new sector that then needs to deal with the same problems that oil and gas has been dealing with for 50 years, but they don't really talk to each other. So a lot of these projects, when they started, they suddenly got oil in their well, and, or gas especially, and they needed to figure out how to deal with it. Or they needed to have a blowout preventer, which wasn't really there. But they're all environmental issues that, um, yeah, if you look at the prognosis of uh, how many geothermal wells there are, uh, are expected in the Netherlands that uh, will require um, uh, hydrogeological expertise to assess uh, those projects. Another area where we've looked at extensively uh, when I was working at KWR is uh, around aquifer thermal energy storage, ATAS. So that's also called shallow geothermal energy. It's not actually extracting heat from the deep surface, but it's using more the, the, the shallower aquifers uh, to store uh, seasonal heat in. So what you do is in, uh, in, uh, in winter, for example, you extract water, which is then warmer than uh, the outside, around 10 degrees, 10, 12 degrees. With a heat pump, you can heat a building with it. The water cools down and you inject it back into the aquifer. And in summer, you re-extract it and you then cool a building with it. So quite a lot of that's really an enormous boom in the Netherlands at the moment that, well, you need a hydrogeological design for almost any of those systems because you need to know whether the right aquifers are present and what the surrounding uh, neighbors are doing with groundwater. So it's uh, for the sort of hydrogeologists in the Netherlands, that's really a booming sector that um, a lot of people are active in. Uh, I didn't work in the design myself. I worked in uh, on addressing questions that were raised by the water companies. Uh, the same uh, aquifers that these systems are put in are also used by uh, water companies for your drinking water supply. And they had the legitimate question, well, okay, hold on. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, maybe Tehu Delft with their uh, ATS well located 500 meters away from me. What does that do with the water quality? If it's, you know, if they extract and eat up the water and a year later re-extract it again. So that was really one key question. You also saw a lot of politics behind it, that you had water companies that were sort of yeah, deciding on their own uh, position. Like they, they were always having a monopoly on uh, fresh uh, groundwater in the Netherlands as being the key user. But because uh, the government really wanted to stimulate uh, renewable energies, uh, you see that, that shifting. The, the biggest user of groundwater now is probably uh, ATAS systems in the Netherlands, and that's stimulated. So. You saw some companies uh, of the water companies were really putting a break on it and they were telling me as a researcher, well, you know, whatever you do, just come up with a report that tells me it's horrible and I can go to the, the, the authorities with that. And other water companies were saying, well, uh, hold on, this may be a nice opportunity for us to diversify uh, what we do and how we can uh, sort of add, uh, add value to our customers. <coughs> So uh, I did that for uh, about five years and also did it part-time at the university. So that's where I got my PhD on, uh, looking both at field sites and at uh, laboratory uh, experiments. So the field site was quite interesting what we saw there. It was at the site in, uh, in Eindhoven. And uh, what we actually found out there was that uh, the main effect is purely mixing of different water qualities. And I've got a, a simulation here that showed that from that time. I'll start playing it now. Basically what it shows is a depth profile with uh, concentrations in color. So shallow water was impacted from superficial processes and you had very high sulfate concentrations and deep groundwater was really nice and quali uh, good quality and had low sulfate concentrations. And what happened is the system started being active. It started extracting water from this stratified quality profile. It mixed it up and then it injected it into the other well. So you had these bubbles of sort of a mix of shallow water and deep water being mixed it, blended up together, different qualities and injected, and you had these sort of perturbations in the water quality profile. I mean, is it bad? Well, in this case, the quality uh, or the concentrations circulated or fluctuated a bit. They were still below the, the threshold values, but it is, you know, you could have other contaminants in that more shallow water that you could drag to greater depths where Originally, you had fresher or cleaner water, but there's not really any um, any temperature effect here, which was also due to the fact that at this site, they only increased it by uh, two to four degrees. So in later work, I looked at well, what would happen if you would really go up to the higher temperatures, so for example, 25 degrees uh, centigrade, 
which is the uh, allowable level in the Netherlands at the moment, and also 60 degrees because that was uh, sort of opening up a new window of opportunities for other systems. So I built a uh, sort of an, uh, yeah, what do you call it, a laboratory uh, mini ATA system with a lot of columns where you were flushing uh, uh, water through at different temperatures and then measured what would happen to that uh, water quality. So really interesting work. It was nice to do something uh, with my hands. Uh, and you saw, well, different impacts. You, you saw an increase in mobility and trace elements. Uh, you saw different, one more slide, different uh, microbiological populations coming up. Uh, overall, if you looked at the smaller uh, temperature degrees, there wasn't a whole big difference, but if you really went up to 25 degrees and above, you could see certain trace elements like arsenic were mobilized, which could be a concern for, uh, for water companies. So summary and take home message, right on time, I think. Um, I mean, if you look at the sector that I'm working in now and uh, how you work there as a uh, hydrogeologist, it will change a lot and that brings opportunities in all different types of ways in cleaning up sites and developing new water resources for new projects and also in the renewables energies. So I think, uh, yeah, as you start at the start of your career or if you stand at the start of your career, uh, there are huge opportunities to work in a wide variety of projects uh, that will all take or require groundwater advice. So that's it. <laughs>
and at the same time you hear that um, you know a project is being delayed because there has to be renegotiation again with the community to allow access so that's yeah how do you deal with that i just think well okay well <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's indeed a continuing uh, aspect, and um, yeah, that, that, those are I think the more softer ethical issues. I mean, if you um, th there's also the real uh, corruption issues that you hear on the news. There's a court case ongoing in Italy now. Uh, yeah, how do you deal with that? If you encounter really things like that, uh, yeah, you're stimulated by the company to go up to your line manager and uh, raise the flags on that. I mean, that's the really things like if you see somebody uh, giving a job to their brother or uh, those sort of things, which are, uh, yeah, I haven't seen it myself, but what you do here, there's uh, quite a um, yeah, strong handle on that to try and root that out. But it's, it's also difficult because it uh, seems to be very much ingrained in uh, operational culture sometimes. Another question by the students. Okay, one more. Uh, yeah, both yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not really a legal question. It's just the 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 the, um, the criteria set by uh, concentrations which you need to achieve. So that's the sort of uh, regulatory framework, and it's it's uh, they they've taken over the legislation from the Netherlands in essence, the soil legislation. So you need to demonstrate that you uh, when you remediate that you go below uh, intervention values, and uh, the way how you do it, so you can. Uh, take some liberty in that yourself, but uh, land farming is, especially in that climate, because it's so hot and moist, it just works really well, and uh, hydrocarbons degrade quite well, so it's by far the uh, most effective uh, way. Yeah, and can you reuse it? Yes. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's uh, no, um, no, in essence, it's better to reuse it than to, uh, to put it in an incinerator or something like that, because then the environmental impact of that would be uh, not so good. Okay, so maybe some final question by one of the professors. So, Tito, you are about to ask one? Okay, um, thanks a lot, guys, for your talk. I, I actually have a question just on how many of you are out there. In a way that, for instance, in Nigeria, you have a colleague also from Shell in, in the water sector or environment sector, if you wish. Do you connect or is it, is it more kind of um, centralized? Uh, well, the, each business, so they, they are more the frontline businesses, they have often environmental people as well. They can be, most of the time they are quite generalist, so they will deal with air quality issues and with uh, water permits or discharge permits yeah. and sort of groundwater issues. And then they are coming to us uh, in the team in uh, Rijswijk for more uh, specialist advice on uh, sort of groundwater issues. And uh, yeah, so each of these assets has that and uh, the centralized group is about 30 people globally. So I think um, this is about it because we have too yeah. many things to move on. And I thank Matthias very much for his very interesting talk. Yeah. And I hope you can stay for another event that will immediately follow. And okay, well, that's good. The rest of the day. Thank yeah. you very much. So that's the game. Yeah. I don't know, but there's a secret that's never really solved before it happens. That we have a break. There's a break, okay. Uh, so we discussed about this interlude of uh, students and everyone in Groundwatch with a performing talent decided they didn't really have the time to prepare or were not feeling like uh, performing for uh, an audience below 2,000 people. Oh. They're really talented. So they just we asked me... Huh? We charge. Yeah, they charge. They don't do it for free anymore. Uh, so decided uh, to put in front someone without any talent other than write corny things. So I'll try my best not to bore to to bore you too much. Um, so first, I want to uh, thank everyone who is here. Uh, thank Arnold and Matthias for such nice uh, talk, uh, very informative. Um, expect my CV in your uh, email soon. <laughs> um, and also, obviously, thanks to our professors. Uh, you've uh, guided us uh, 
educated us in uh, a lot of ways. Also, I think the um, moral and uh, affective guidance has been very important. <laughs> and um, so, uh, yesterday I started feeling uh, a little nervous uh, and excited just as I feel before Christmas and all my family will come over and we will sit down and tell stories and eat too much food and make a lot of noise, uh, see each other and be reminded of all the things that we have in common. And I guess this is, a, this is exactly the same thing. My family has come from uh, all over Europe. Uh, you guys, uh, to eat too much, make a lot of noise. Um, so, more than two years ago, all of us were packing our lives in one or two suitcases. The favorite shirt or sari or dress or glitter for that special occasion. The many pullovers mom recommended to carry because you never know. Uh, pictures, sizes, postcards, figurines, and everything that could fit in a bag and remind us of home. That place we would have to say goodbye for more than two. We, that place we had to say goodbye more than two years ago. Um, some of us leaving our parents' house for the first time. Others walking away from a life they had built, uh, so that we could all search a great perhaps, a new life, a new me, a new you. Uh, then we arrived to this bizarre country with, with bright colors and sad music. I remember very well our first meetings, asking the countries, the food types, and the jokes where we all came from, uh, telling each other why we were so interested in this groundwater and uh, what we were expecting of this master. Uh, and shyly but surely, getting to know this group of international and mysterious strangers. The next scene has a bunch of us talking about everything and nothing as we speed out of Obidos on our way to an ancient burial site where we lie down on giant rocks to see the stars. <laughs> that afternoon we watched the falling leaves carried by a sunset wind through the hills. As those leaves, the days fell one after the other, piling up on what became our daily lives surrounded by each other. An accumulation of talks over lunch and also of projects, nights out in Lisbon, Tejo sunsets, projects, dinners, projects, Bairro Alto, lovely walks, projects, and of course, birthday cakes. Until one day, we had to pack everything in one or two or sometimes three suitcases. Uh, but this time, we were not leaving everything behind. That group of mysterious strangers were now friends, teachers, therapists, healers, accomplices, partners. We left the city behind, but we took with us a home. In Delft, some of us understood why it was a big deal about spring uh, in Europe. Uh, the charm of late days and picnics and the heartbreak of having to describe the redox sequence of sewage leaching in the library during the last sunny day of the week. Being an er in er Erasmus master together made us close and I could say friends, but living together in a tiny van doing muddy laundry and titrating well samples at night made us a family. <laughs> we survived a flood and we survived assignments once again. And then for a third time in a year, we left the life we had in one city to start a new one in a new place. Taking the train to Tatan Forest became a ritual. Rushing to the station, finding ground watchers inside the train, chatting over the last weekend, laughing at, at the latest story of a flooding on someone's study project, enjoying the transition of the city into the forest, of autumn into winter, the green to yellow, to red, to branches, to white. Dresden had two big challenges, winter and the first time we didn't see each other uh, all day, every day. With some Neustadt, Blue vine and free trams, we managed to appease both. 
part of growing up in every family uh, means that some people move out, uh, some others change their schedules, drift a little bit apart, but sure one thing remains. They will share funny pictures on the WhatsApp group. And so after moving for a fourth time in two years, we kept in touch, even being in different cities in several continents, bonded by the task of, uh, of thesis, shared history and deep caring for each other. We were all connected by underground wires in a delicate network. Trouble in Delft was heard in Central America and Indian Portugal would come to the rescue. Chit Chat would travel on every Thursday bus from Dresden to Delft and back. Mutual support and interventions to take us out of libraries and into bars uh, kept a lot of us afloat. Some of us had a rougher time than others, uh, but this was an intense journey that wouldn't have been the same without this cheering team of qualified young researchers backing us all up. If this ceremony is a climax, then it is built over 24 months of weaving a thread that speaks more than 25 languages, then can cook the most delicious meals you will ever know and is a caring network that shelters. Guys, the training of you understand this life-changing journey more than anyone could ever. I can only say that I'm eternally grateful to all of you. You have become my family. I can, I can only wish you the very best lives you could possibly live. Of course, I am happy I have made great contacts with future renowned scientists, dynamic entrepreneurs and high degree decision makers, but I'm happier I'll get to know about your daily mischiefs and sentimental updates. These threads that connect us will stretch around the world for years and years, and I'm not asking, I'm telling you, we'll keep in touch. Welcome, dear participants, honored guests, colleagues, friends, and family. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the graduation day of the Erasmus Moon's Master Programs in Flood Risk Management and Groundwater and Global Change, Impact and Adaption, also known as Groundwatch. Uh, we start with some opening speeches by the rector and representatives of our partner university, followed by the awarding ceremony. I now give the floor to our rector, Professor Eddie Morris. So, good afternoon. It's uh, nice to see you all here. I think it's a, a very special day, and uh, I think especially, uh, not for the first row, although it's special as well, but especially the rows behind uh, the first row. I think uh, after today, uh, I think you're going into a phase, a new phase in your life, a new phase especially in your professional career. And uh, we hope that uh, with what uh, you have been uh, hearing about, I hope you remember something of what you heard here and that you will take uh, that home with you and that you will use it as well. And I think, uh, first of all, uh, it's something that's important for yourself, but I also think it's very important for your family, for your friends, those who are here. And I think also for us uh, here as uh, IG staff, 
uh, but also I think for all the people that have contributed to that. And for that, I would like uh, to welcome, actually, especially um, Professor Christian Bernhofer from uh, Dresden University of Technology in Germany. So thanks very much for coming. Professor Alan Bateman from the Technical University of Catalonia in Spain. So very welcome. Professor Mitya Brilli from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. Very welcome. And Professor Luis Ribera, University of Lisbon in, in Portugal. And uh, Dr. Teresa Miller, also from the University of Lisbon in uh, Portugal. And uh, I think uh, with, uh, I think already with the names of the different places and universities that I mentioned, it also shows, I think, the, the specialty of this program that you uh, were working in. Um, I personally think it's something that I envy you about a little bit, that you had the opportunity to uh, work and sit at different universities and see all those differences. Not only because the different locations and the different uh, advisors and staff that you had there, but also because you had the opportunity to meet one another and also to talk one another. And I hope that uh, this will be an, an, uh, a bond that uh, you will keep for the rest of your life. And I hope that you will do the same also for the water sector, of which uh, we are, um, I think, one of all very proud. But we also see big need for people like yourself to contribute to the water sector and to improve actually how we use the water resources that we have available on the globe. So with that, I would like uh, to give uh, the floor back uh, to the Beetle. And um, I hope that we can hand out. Now we first have another some speeches. I would like to invite Mishwa to say it. Dear graduating students and their family members, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Today is a special day. Some of our students are graduating. It's not only special for you, it's also very special for us. We are always proud when we see our students graduate. I take this opportunity to congratulate you. And I am sure that you will use your new knowledge and the diploma, which comes with the knowledge that uh, is, as a weapon in solving problems of the water world. If you think that all your challenges are over, I think very soon you will be understood that it's a mistake. The real challenges are waiting for you when you enter the professional world and then every day you have a new assignment to submit. Yes, to your first, to your boss, to your clients and to whatnot. Today is also the uh, graduation of the seventh batch of flood risk management students. We don't have a large number of them today, but in about uh, 10 days, a much bigger group is joining the program 30 students with 20 scholarship holders and about 10 cell pairs. So, very soon, this room will be filled up also with new batches of Groundwatch and another program method. The graduates of flood risk management over the years they have named themselves as floodies. So we have about I think about 120 floodies in last six years, maybe 115, and they are dealing with floods, global flooding issues around the world, and floods are fortunately or unfortunately everywhere. So that keep our graduates busy. And today some more graduates will be joining this group. And I think over the years we have formed a family of floodies. We are growing. I'm very happy to announce that the European Commission has uh, given us grant, new grant extension for the continuation of this program. So this program will continue for some more years together with also Groundwatch. So in the future you will see that more students are coming. I will take this opportunity to thank also the European Commission for giving us grant and keeping trust on our program. And uh, I think our flood is as they named and this will, this new funding will keep supply of flood is and I don't know how the ground watch graduates you call yourself ground is or something <laughs> ground watches so the flood is and ground watches they will be you know significantly contribute to solving global water problems. 
I take this opportunity once again to congratulate you for your graduation. Thank you. I would now like to invite uh, Professor Christian Berhoff for a few words. So, thank you very much, um, students, graduates, colleagues. It's about what you're going to be today. So, from a student to a graduate becoming a colleague, I'm glad to speak here on behalf of Field Dresden. Little story before, so it's about 25 years ago that, that the thing started, 15 years about ago that the relationship to IG started through Dimitri Son Martin and Bisla that were both, both present in a EU project called Flatsight. And then there was the idea to develop from the course that we started together the whole program and then IG stepped in to do it. So it's also about collaboration, cooperation with IG that we are celebrating here today, but mostly we are celebrating you as the students. And there are, as this was already mentioned, there are 120 almost flood risk students. There are definitely almost 60 students of groundwater um, study specifically. And I want to highlight the amount of collaboration that's included with this and cooperation. There was the cooperation between the institutions, cooperations between you. There have been many highlights in your study and mostly today it's Crowd watchers, what I just learned that you self call yourself ground watchers. I was aware about the flooding. And um, I think it starts always with traveling, and you recall these things. I re first time I always meet the students is during the field class, and I appreciate very much that this is an intensive way to get acquainted to each other. And something when you do something together, it's always very helpful because you share your problems, you cha share your abilities and you share also your prospects and that's something that will help you to get along in the future. And cooperation in, in a world that becomes more and more complicated, more and more demanding to keep cooperation alive. So I think you will be maybe the agents of change or maybe also sometimes the angels of happening that there shouldn't be too much change in a cooperating world because at the moment I have sometimes the fear that the amount of non-cooperation is increasing. So I think you have a good training also to understand that not only water is a binding material, also other things are binding materials that will help you to overcome certain problems that we face in a growing world with growing problems. So there's one thing I always say at these occasions, and this tells you also about cooperation. This is an African proverb that says, if you want to travel fast, you have to travel alone. But if you want to travel far, you have to travel together. So happy graduation and have a good life as a um, master of water. I would now like to uh, invite Professor uh, Brilli from Indiana University. much for this opportunity because it is a great day not only for you but also for us. Give us an all not knowing that we do a good job, I hope, give you some knowledge and um, for one side uh, and for the other side it was also a challenge to have so much, so smart students in the classroom and uh, it is also some uh, uh, great, great, uh, great uh, feeling uh, doing, doing with you. Uh, for sure, I know that you will make a well and good career. What I would like to ask you, please stay together, connected in the future as you are during your study, because it is really a challenge to spend the time on different situations almost 
two years and it is something which give you uh, possibility and challenge and development uh, which is not uh, so strong related in the other classroom and other students. It's really challenging. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Vini. I would now like to invite Professor Alan Baker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Rector. Good afternoon, Professors. Good afternoon, Grandis <laughs> and Thais. <laughs> um, I can speak mathematics and physics, but uh, make a speech like this is very difficult to me. I write something to you, to the students. I have to use my glasses. Everything you make, do it with passion. I'm 60 years old and I am fan of the Beatles. Uh, I have to read some uh, sentence refer about the Beatles. I'm sorry. <clears throat> do it better all the time. Of course, you have to do it every day of your life. Life is what happened to you when you're busy making all the plans. Life flow like a river and drag you. You have to be prepared. All the best for you. Thank you very much. We now proceed with the part you've all been waiting for, the actual awarding of the diplomas. We start with flood risk management. The ones from Groundport need to have just a little bit more patience. Um, I first ask our rector and Professor Brini to take a position there so that the photographer can also make a nice picture and we can maybe join them. I first call Mr. Javier Ignacio de la Cruz Fernandez from Spain. So we need to change some people on stage. 
Professor Brilli and Professor Bacon, thank you for taking a seat on the front row. And I would like to call Professor Ruggiero and Professor Graham Newitt to the stage. particular uh, the graduates or uh, we, we are now holding up on that. <laughs> um, let me give you a little bit of a personal reflection on groundwater. It's a bit uh, bittersweet for me because um, <coughs> when I'm at home in South Africa, I'm one of the missing numbers in the JMP data that Trafael dealt with in his master's thesis. I use a borehole. It's sweet for me because it's artesian, 800 litres an hour, very nice. It's bitter because it's fluoride, it's very high fluoride, and you can't really use it. Except in times of drought, when it has a really, really high value, and we can do something with it expensively. But what it really highlights is that often groundwater, or groundwater is undervalued. I think you guys are starting to realize that, and we don't see its value all that often. Now, next week, I'm actually going to a workshop at the World Water Development Report for the World Water Development Report in 2021, which is on valuing water. Now, those World Water Development Reports are quite important because what they do is they set the agenda for the World Water Days every year. And the World Water Days are rolled out internationally, and they're also the theme at the Stockholm World Water Week. And I think someone attended the World Water Week this year from the ground up, yeah. So, so, so 2021, the theme will be valuing water. But importantly for you guys, in 2022, thanks to a lot of lobbying by people like Nana and others, the theme is groundwater, making the invisible visible. So something to look forward to in 2022. So I think that really highlights the, the importance of the field and the relevance of ground watch for the work uh, that you've done. But what I wanted to do was just acknowledge uh, the vision of the organizers of Groundwatch, the guys who started the program, uh, who I guess were sitting <laughs> in the front, front row here, uh, for recognizing the importance of a program like this, getting it up and running. Obviously, Groundwatch is important for groundwater, but the program I think you've heard today, it's multinational, it's multicultural. It deals with issues of life as well as the technical aspects that you've uh, been exposed to. So really it is a program for our time. So I want to salute all the staff involved, the guys who uh, got it going, but also to acknowledge the lecturers across the institutions, the mentors who really spent huge amounts of time working with you on your dissertations. The, the time and effort that goes into that, I think, is uh, also somewhat invisible at times. And I think I'd also just like to note the efforts of the other IIT staff who've worked in the background to make a ceremony like this uh, happen. There's a lot of work that goes into the program that we don't always see. So to the students, I think you've uh, been exposed to a program that is really relevant for our times. Um, you've had a unique opportunity, and from what I've heard from the discussions this morning, the feedback, you really made the most of that to get to know each other, to learn more than just about groundwater, uh, to build a community. And you're now embarking on a career. You've got a really good grounding technically, but the network that you've built is really going to be a foundation for going forward. And uh, I think with the tools that we have today, those networks are easy to maintain and it really is critical 
that you build those networks, you maintain those networks, and I'm not talking just about amongst your, yourselves, but with your mentors and other people you've been exposed to. It's the start of a really strong um, career. So in essence, your diploma, which you will receive shortly, is more than just a piece of paper. There's been far more to it than that. So my congratulations to all of you. Thank you very much. Um, hello all. Uh, here we are. Uh, the day of the graduation of the third batch already of Grand Watchers. Third generation, so it's uh, already uh, running for quite some time. It's amazing how time flies, of course, when you're having fun. Um, Groundwatch is actually uh, known in the full world as Groundwood and Global Change, Impact and Adaptation. Um, so, of course, during this course, uh, Graham said it already, you learn to make, uh, to, to make the invisible visible. And, um, of course, Groundwood is a hidden resource and therefore often undervaluated. But it's, of course, vital as a freshwater resource um, for, the increasing, for increasing food and water security, of course, for the billions of people uh, and the growing population. But we also see, you know, we see, of course, Groundwork as a major role player in, for instance, uh, attaining the sustainable, sustainable development goals. We see that it's also threatened, of course, by uh, exploitation, over-exploitation or contamination. Um, of course, we are using water um, as, as we need it, um, but we need to protect it for, for its value that, that it has. Um, so they're the third generation Groundwatchers. Um, from today onwards, you will be able to call yourself certified ground watchers. Um, but with great knowledge comes great responsibility. Um, it will be your responsibility, actually, to increase the visibility of ground water and to raise awareness about the need to protect this resilient, but at the same time very uh, sensitive resource. And, of course, to help find solutions uh, for adaptation to these global and climatic changes. Wherever you will be throughout your future careers, be it in academia, NGOs, public or private sectors, use your skills wisely. Be ambassadors of the program. Accept the challenge to transfer your knowledge and share experiences with others. Um, and what now seems perhaps obvious to you may often be a revelation to others. So, again, make the invisible visible because we need all the help we can get. Um, keep on going and don't give up, even when the situation may sometimes become frustrating as you have, of course, experienced uh, to a certain extent in the past, let's say, month and a half. Yeah. Be optimistic, be realistic, but especially be optimist. And I'm sure you'll succeed. Um, I have accompanied, accompanied you on your journey um, over the past two years, of course. Um, I've come to know you a bit. I've learned, I've listened to your stories, um, seen, your, seen your involved, felt your commitment, felt your determination. <laughs> even in these moments of stress or doubt, wondering whether you're going to finish analyzing those results, completing those graphics, the models, or writing the thesis, and let alone defend it in front of a community. But that's all over now. So it's time to pick up your reward. Next Monday, actually, the fifth generation of Groundwatch will start um, their journey and follow in your footsteps. Um, we will need to commemorate that fifth graduation even more. And I really look forward to that day, and I will invite you all, of course, to join. Um, I'm happy and grateful to be continuing this journey with all my colleagues, especially um, Teresa, Luis, Christian, but also all the others who are involved. Today is your day, so you did very well, and I'm proud of you. Thank you. I would like to invite Professor Lidia from Lisbon University. Thank you. Well, uh, congratulations for all the Grand Watchers. Uh, I have some words. Uh, in the topic of groundwater, the nature based solution for the future. Uh, the management of water resources requires new solutions to counteract 
the growing challenge of water security arising from population growth and climate change. Today, more than ever, you must work with nature rather than against it. The great challenge is to take full advantage of nature's potential to contribute to the achievement of the three main objectives of water management. Increase the availability of water resources, improve the quality and reduce water-related risks. Groundwater and aquifer-related natural-based solutions hold major and realized potential for alleviating adverse impacts of both flutes and droughts in the same region of basin and impacts of progressive climate change overall. Aquifer-centric natural-based solutions such as large-scale managed aquifer recharge interventions may be applied to certain physiographic conditions to alleviate the risks of both fluids and droughts in the same river basins. The solution is found in the past, revisiting, visiting, groundwater ancestral wisdom and techniques. All these civilizations have developed ingenious natural-based solutions to adapt to extreme climate scenarios, such as longer droughts, managing water resources in a holistic way, and how they understood clearly the global water cycle in all the components, specifically groundwater. One of the possible approaches are found in the trilogy to sell, to retain, to collect. To sell water by implementing ancestral aquifer research solutions. To retain water by improving aerobic efficiency in terms of infiltration and drainage. And finally, to collect water by improving the performance of extraction in the subterranean fluids in some arid regions. There are many examples of symbiosis between man and the environment. For instance, during the colonial times in Peru, thousands of hectares of canoa were cut down to make bridge roofs mines, as well as tillage roofs, tillage tools. Even today, the peasants, the peasants burned the tips to force them to germinate fresh and juice pastures with the water to feed the cattle. It is not known that the canoa roots and their formidable stems intervene in the water cycles and that droughts in regions where streams use to run have to do with a progressive disappearance. Nowadays, there is more and more a growing need to recognize the cosmogonic and spiritual representations of indigenous societies around water and their possible contributions to a more balanced vision for their use and conservation. In this sense, although the Western and indigenous conceptions of water resources can cause conflicts, they can be a factor of complementary and cooperation that feeds strategies for a sustainable development. It is a great pleasure to see Groundwater Network increase year by year in terms of countries, case studies, affections, friendships and cultures. I am very pleased to be part of this project. It was and has been a wonderful experience since IAG Delft and TUD for the collaboration. Many, many thanks to the new graduate Master of Science, I desire a great success for your professional or academic careers. We will be missing you. Thank you. We now finally proceed with awarding of the diplomas of the Grand Watch Masters. Uh, I would first call upon Professor Eddy. Um, Professor Graham Hewitt and Tibor to take their position. <laughs> Mrs. Ritzwana Binte Delva from Bangladesh.
Moldova from Kazakhstan. Mr. Juan 
Francesco Local von Colombia. First of all, uh, congratulations to uh, all of you. I think uh, you did a, a very good uh, job. And uh, I hope that uh, also referring to the words that were spoken to you by uh, the different uh, professors that were guiding you, that you will uh, take them with you and uh, that you use them uh, well. 
Um, I think on, on the serious side uh, there, uh, we do expect uh, that uh, you now got a, a lot of, uh, I think, authority also in the water world, but uh, that authority also comes with uh, some obligations. And one of them is that you are also expected uh, to work following the code of conduct for the different universities. I'm sure you will do that, but I think it's still good to stress that that's important. And uh, I think that uh, one of the things I hope that you also will take with you, besides uh, a lot of knowledge, is also how you work together. And I think uh, I again would like uh, to thank our partners actually, uh, that also made it possible uh, to offer you uh, this course here. So thanks very much for that. And, uh, And I think that uh, also uh, when I was listening to the different speakers, uh, we now have uh, floodies in the room here. We have uh, certified uh, ground watches here. I think you also now have a, a tune. You have to still find out which tune of the Beatles it is, but uh, I hope you will sing that somewhere tonight. Uh, maybe you can ask some guidance on which tune uh, to sing, but I'm curious uh, to hear that uh, later on. Um, I also think that uh, with the, the diploma that you got uh, today, uh, you also have become a member of the alumni uh, family of IG. And uh, for us at IG, it's uh, very important that this family grows because we see an urgent need in a larger uh, family working at the, the water sector. For us, and I think I'm also talking for our partner universities, it's also very important to keep in contact with you because uh, we also learn a lot from you. And uh, when you work in the field and you encounter new problems, and we're sure that you will encounter new problems that you haven't encountered before, uh, we are very interested to learn about it as well, uh, not only because we're interested to adjust the program that we are offering our new students, but also that uh, we think that in some cases, uh, maybe we can uh, be of help, and maybe we can look at a collaboration uh, that we can do to see how we can tackle those uh, new issues that will come up. It was already mentioned that uh, in two years' time, World Water Day will be about uh, invisible water, so that's especially about uh, groundwater. And I think that uh, looking at uh, some of the changes that you see here, I know that both the governments of uh, Germany and the governments of Sweden are now thinking about introducing irrigation. And that is because we had those droughts. A big question, of course, is where will they get the water from? One of the possible water sources will be the surface water reservoirs, but the other one will be groundwater. And I think that in some of the countries where you're coming from, there's much more expertise on that than in these countries. So I think it's not a one-way uh, knowledge transfer, but I really believe in this two-way knowledge transfer. So I do hope that you will also provide your knowledge to us as uh, partners. With that, I would like to, uh, first of all, invite everybody for a reception downstairs in our restaurant. But before we do that, I would also like to invite you, and I'm not talking about the students and all the lecturers, to take a picture uh, downstairs at the entrance of uh, the building. So I hand over actually the organization to the Beatle again, who will guide us in who's going where. Thank you.